Johnstone. I'm a fiction editor with the New Quarterly. I'm pleased to welcome you to our ninth annual Wild Writers Literary Festival. This year's festival is unique because we are hosting you online from Waterloo throughout the month of November. Although we miss hosting you in person, uh, of course, I'd be trying to get 71 now people in a room. Uh, we're happy to be able to welcome viewers from across the country to the festival, and that's great. Please visit our website, wildwriters.ca, for a list of the workshops, conversations, mentorships, and meditations. So I'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors. We are grateful for their support of the ninth annual Wild Writers Literary Festival. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers who have made this festival possible. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce Jack Wang in his session on holding attention. Jack is a PhD in English with an emphasis in creating write, creative writing from Florida State University. In 2014-15, he held the David T. K. Wong Creative Writing Fellowship at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. Stories in his debut collection, We Too Alone, dramatized the Chinese diaspora across the globe over the last 200 years. And have been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and longlisted for the Journey Prize and have appeared in many fine literary uh, journals, including, of course, the New Quarterly. Originally from Vancouver, Jack is an associate professor in the Department of Writing at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York, where he lives with his wife, novelist Angelina Mirabella, and their two daughters. Now I'll turn it over to you, Jack. Thank you, Bruce. And uh... Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I know there's a, a lot going on in the world, especially here uh, in the States. So thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Um, let's see, everyone can see me and hear me. Um, I wanna start by thanking Pamela Malloy for inviting me. I'd also like to thank Emily Bednarts and Roxy Hearn for, for running the show. Um, since this is the Wild Writers Literary Festival, I thought it would be fitting to uh, think about what it means to be, as Jonathan Gottschall puts it, the storytelling animal. Um, this presentation will take an evolutionary and neuroscientific approach to why we tell stories. As you know from the event description, one of the questions this presentation asks is what kinds of narrative strategies earn attention in fiction. And my goal is not so much uh, to give you um, a whole array of new strategies so much as help you understand the evolutionary and neuroscientific bases for some of the strategies you're likely already using. I should add that although I did major in biology as an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, that was over 25 years ago. So biologist and I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, uh, but I am a fiction writer who has taken uh, an interest in the burgeoning field of evolutionary approaches to literature. I'll talk for um, just north of 30 minutes and then I'll try to answer uh, some of your questions. So here is uh, when I share the screen. So I hope uh, that's visible to all of you and somebody can certainly let me know if that's not the case. Um, but I'm going to start by um, just giving you an outline of what I plan to talk about. Um, I'm gonna try to answer a fundamental question. Why do we tell stories? Um, what is the evolutionary purpose of stories? And uh, then we're going to reverse engineer fiction, look at the anatomy of fiction in order to understand the uses of fiction in uh, the evolutionary sense. And uh, we're going to look at one particular aspect of human life, which is ultra sociality. And then we're going to end by looking at um, a literary example. And I'm just going to keep it uh, a surprise for now what that literary example will be. So um, 
just to get started, I want to uh, cite Murray Smith in his essay, Darwin and the Directors, in which he says, traditional humanists often argue that an appeal to natural science and especially evolutionary theory necessarily results in explanations that are reductive, deterministic, and politically reactionary. He goes on to say, an insular humanism that disdains scientific insight and the misguided belief in its complete autonomy from the stuff of the natural sciences is a much impoverished one. For this reason, the humanities simply cannot turn away from the hypotheses and discoveries of science, including evolutionary science. So the fact that you all are here, um, you know, presumably you're interested in the subject, but this is a way to head off any skepticism anyone might have about this presentation. The goal is not to reduce all of literature to biology, but to understand how culture is built atop the deeper stratum of our evolutionary past and to help reconcile what uh, C.P. Snow famously called the two cultures of humanities and the sciences. And let me just add that um, I'm not going to rehearse evolution and natural selection. I'm going to assume that you have a general understanding of those concepts. So the, the fundamental, fundamental question is why do we tell stories? Uh, storytelling is a human universal and its universality as well as its antiquity suggests a biological purpose. In evolutionary terms, though, the fact that we tell stories is somewhat counterintuitive. In his uh, book, The Storytelling Animal, Jonathan Gottschall suggests the fact that we tell stories is actually something of a riddle. As he puts it, the riddle of fiction comes to this. Evolution is ruthlessly utilitarian. How has the seeming luxury of fiction not been eliminated from human life? So why would our ancestors uh, sitting around the campfire, so to speak, tell stories when they could have been hunting and gathering or making tools or building shelters or procreating for that matter? Things that would have contributed more directly to survival and reproduction. Why bother telling stories? And the question of why we tell stories is, is related to the larger question of why we create art. As Gottschall says, why do people make and consume art when doing so has real costs in time and energy and no obvious biological payoffs? So, you know, the goal um, of, part of the goal of this talk is to, to help us understand uh, if there are biological payoffs. So let's take, for example, the upper Paleolithic atlatl which looks like this. An atlatl is a spear thrower. This one was probably used around 20,000 years ago. And uh, if we know that an atlatl increases the uh, velocity and the thrust of um, a spear and allows you to throw it with greater accuracy from a greater distance, we don't wonder why make an atlatl. We know why it makes sense to make an atlatl. But if you look closely at this atlatl, what you'll see at the top is a carving of an ibex. And uh, an ibex is a wild mountain goat. And in this case, not sure if you can tell, but it's actually giving birth. And um, the ibex carved at the top of the atlatl is something of a mystery. Um, because, you know, this doesn't appear on the surface to improve the atlatl, to improve your chances of hunting successfully. Why not dedicate the time uh, that you, you've devoted to carving this at, at the ibex to sharpening your spear, for example, or designing a better atlatl? So the ibex is what uh, philosopher Daniel Dennett calls exceeding the functional. This carving exceeds the functional. So Daniel Dennett says, if we see a dog rooting around for food, we don't ask why. 
But if the dog does somersaults while it's rooting around for food, then we ask why, because that exceeds the functional. So art in general and stories in particular appear to exceed the functional, which compels us to ask why. So um, we're gonna move on to the next section, which is reverse engineering narrative. And this is the title of an essay by Michelle Scalise Sukiyama, an anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist. And she asked the question, uh, life as a hunter-gatherer is difficult, arduous, and dangerous. Given these conditions, why would our upper Pleistocene or Stone Age ancestors bother to take time, take the time to tell stories? So uh, this is important. You know, when we ask the question, why do we tell stories? We're not asking, uh, why do we read and write novels in the modern world? Although, of course, there's some connection. What we're asking is why my stories have given our species some kind of adaptive advantage 100,000 years ago on the savanna, so to speak. Okay, so we have to think about our ancestors in the past, okay, and why stories might have given them some kind of biological advantage in the Stone Age. So in her essay, Scalise Sugiyama suggests um, that we try to reverse engineer narrative, basically look at the anatomy, the constituent parts of narrative to try to infer their purpose. And so it'll come as no surprise to anyone who's read fiction that she says fiction basically boils down to agents and actions and conflict. And this is how she describes narrative conflict. She says it's rooted in human goals, obstacles to their achievement and attempts to surmount those obstacles. Now this pattern that she describes is so common in narrative that Jonathan Gottschall calls it the universal grammar of story. So in the storytelling animal, he says, story is character, plus predicament, plus attempted extrication. He says this is the universal grammar story. And of course, the term universal suggests it's not just contemporary or Western fiction, but narrative cross-culturally. You know, if you go to the myths of hunter-gatherer hunter societies and so on, um, you, go, you look cross-culturally, narrative follows this basic pattern. Um, and if you think about it, stories could take other forms, right? Stories could take other forms. For example, our stories could be pure wish fulfillment fantasies. But, you know, when's the last time any of us read or watched a story in which everything went right and nothing bad happened, right? Um, if you're sitting in the beach, or lying in the bathtub, um, reading a novel, you're you know, usually reading about murder and mayhem, um, even as you escape or read for fun or for pleasure, right? So um, as Scalise Sugiyama says, the function of narrative then would appear to be the representation of problems humans encounter in their lives and the constraints individuals struggle against in their efforts to solve them. So this tells us um, what a story is, but it doesn't quite answer the question of what a story is for. As Scalise Sugiyama asks herself, why spend time generating or processing representations of human beings and their problems? To put it in evolutionary terms, what possible benefits does such a representational system offer to the upper Pleistocene or Stone Age hunter-gatherer? So this leads us to the uses of fiction. So Scalise Sugiyama in her essay, she does go on to talk about, um, she goes on to try to answer her own question and to talk about the benefits of fiction. But I'm actually gonna to turn to a chapter called The Uses of Fiction in Dennis Dutton's book, uh, The Art Instinct, because he offers um, a neat summary of the benefits of, of story. So he suggests that there are three main benefits or uses of fiction. And the first is 
stories um, contain information. They store and they transmit information, okay? Scully Sugiyama herself says that, that narrative is this, you know, information storage and transmission system. If you think about it in the pre prehistoric world, if you have a story, fictional otherwise, that conveys the best place to hunt or how to hunt, that can be extremely crucial information for, that contributes to fitness, which is to say uh, the ability to survive and reproduce. Um, you know, in the modern world, we have search engines to, to store and retrieve information, but in the pre-modern world, stories would have been the information storage and transmission system. So that's one use of fiction um, that would have afforded a benefit to our um, Stone Age ancestors. Uh, the next one, and this is, I think, uh, crucial, um, arguably um, more important, Stories provide low cost, low risk surrogate experience. Fictions are preparations for life and its surprises. Um, acquiring knowledge firsthand is time consuming, energy intensive and potentially dangerous. For example, if you only learned how to outrun predators by actually running from lions and tigers, your chances, you know, if you only if you only learned in those high risk, high cost environments, then your chances of survival, of course, are much lower. Your chances of survival would increase significantly if you could rehearse in advance for such a situation. Uh, for example, uh, and we do, for example, children play tech. Uh, children almost universally love um, chasing and being chased. They get a shot of dopamine in the brain, which they experience as pleasure or fun. But in fact, they're training their bodies and their minds to catch prey and to evade pre predation in a low risk and low cost environment. If you get tagged, you don't die, right? But you're rehearsing and you're training your mind and your body for the possibility of having to escape in real life. So, you know, somewhere in our evolutionary past, somebody, you know, had a propensity for chasing and being chased. Maybe they got an extra shot of dopamine in the brain. And that little bit of rehearsal helped them survive and reproduce. And that propensity got passed on to their offspring, who in turn, we're better able to survive and reproduce and to pass on that propensity, okay? Maybe they, you know, with successive generations, there was more dopamine every time they played until that propensity to play um, in that way became species-wide and developmentally reliable in all individuals. Um, it's the kind of built-in reward system that um, our bodies have to motivate what's, what's good for us. So um, basically the point I'm making is that like play, stories are a form of practice and rehearsal. Uh, in fact, in On the Origins of Stories by Brian Boyd, he argues that uh, human art evolved from animal play and animals of other species do play. So stories like play are simulations or virtual reality. Stories are the original actually virtual reality. Um, that allows us to rehearse strategies and refine skills in low risk situations in preparation for real life. So, you know, this really explains the prevalence, uh, even the ubiquity of problem structure in stories. Our minds are drawn to problem structure because simulations of problems in our attempts to solve them were simply more useful to our ancestors. Um, you know, just seeing uh, simulations of situations that one might encounter and attempts to solve those predicaments um, contributed to survival and reproduction. So cross-cultural studies show that conflicts 
uh, make narrative more memorable. And we have, again, a propensity for conflict, for problem structure. And despite attempts by many writers to break out of what they perceive to be the tyranny uh, of problem structure, uh, conflict remains crucial to holding attention. And so to the extent that you want your reader to enter effortlessly into a story, and of course, some writers don't necessarily um, want to tell a traditional story, problem structure remains key. So the uh, third use of fiction is that stories encourage us to explore the points of view, beliefs, motivations, and values of other human minds, inculcating potentially adaptive interpersonal and social capacities. They extend mind reading capabilities that begin in infancy and come into full flower in adult sociality. So this leads to the next section of uh, my presentation on ultra sociality. So, and you know, if you're one of those writers who feels a little bit stifled by problem structure, then you might be heartened uh, by, you know, this section of the discussion, uh, as I'll try to explain. Um, but if stories are about problems, then one question we might ask is, what is, what is our biggest problem in life? Put differently, um, the question might be, what is the most complex aspect of our environment? What is the most complex aspect of the human environment? You know, the answer is possibly changing in the modern world, but certainly in the prehistoric world in Stone Age, the answer would have been, um, as the title of this slide suggests, conspecifics. And that word means members uh, of your own species. In short, the most complex aspects of our environment is other human beings. You know, and even in the modern world, this might be true. You know, when you go off to college, for example, or university, yes, you have to, you know, maybe master your coursework and, and um, deal with calculus and so on. But, you know, the real complexities are dealing with your roommates, you know, negotiating your teachers, uh, trying to meet people, make friends, to, you know, find where you belong. And so those are, you know, those remain some of the greatest if not the greatest challenges of uh, any environment, the, the social dimension. So um, human beings are not just social, we're actually an ultra social or hyper social species. So Dennis Dutton, you may recall uh, in the last slide, he talked about the idea of mind reading capabilities. You know, what did he mean by mind reading capabilities? To help us understand the complexity of our social environment, uh, we actually have the ability to mind read, for example, um, through theory of mind. Those of you who've studied psychology will be familiar with the concept of theory of mind. Theory of mind is the understanding that the contents of one's mind are distinct from other people's minds. It describes our ability to explain other people's behavior in terms of their thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and intentions. In short, theory of mind is our ability to infer other people's mental states. You know, this might seem obvious to you, but we might be the only species that possesses theory of mind, certainly to the, you know, the degree that we do. And not every individual um, has theory of mind at every stage of life. Uh, it doesn't develop reliably in all individuals until between the ages of four and five. So um, again, those of you who studied psychology probably know this, but the famous test for theory of mind is the Sally Ann test. And this is a test that's often performed on children and they'll use dolls and, you know, to act this out. But as you can see from this graphic, this is basically the way the Sally Ann test works, Sal, you know, the child is told Sally puts her marble in the basket and then Sally goes away and moves the marble and then Sally comes back. And then the child is asked, where will Sally look for her marble? 
Now, all of you know that Sally will look in the basket because that's where she left it. Um, but a child who's three years old will say, Sally will look in the box. That's because the child who's three knows that the marble is in the box and cannot yet distinguish the contents of their mind from anyone else's mind. So what they know is what everyone else knows. They don't yet have a theory of how minds work. They don't yet have theory of mind. So they don't understand what's called first order false belief. You know, in order to understand that Sally holds a false belief, you have to understand she has a mind separate from your own and that it, the contents of those minds, you know, of that mind is different from your own. So this is a special cognitive ability um, that human beings have. And as Lisa Zunshine says in her book, Why We Read Fiction, the emergence of a theory of mind module was evolution's answer to the staggeringly complex challenge faced by our ancestors who needed to make sense of the behavior of other people in their group, which could include up to 200 individuals. So uh, many evolutionary psychologists actually believe that stories arose out of gossip um, or the need for social monitoring. In other words, keeping tabs on members of our group to see who had power, who had status, who was forming alliances with whom, who, who was mating with whom, who was helping you, who was cheating you, and so on. Um, and a group of just 50 individuals produces over a thousand individual relationships. So even a group of 50 is enormously complex and keeping tabs on you know, all of the social dynamics when the group was uh, a serious cognitive challenge. And you know, Steven Pinker and How the Mind Works suggests that group living is one of the things, not the only thing, one of the things that drove human brain growth. Brains, of course, are notoriously expensive. Um, they only constitute about two and a half percent of our, our body weight, but they use between 20 and 30 percent of our resting energy. So, you know, most species, in fact, no other species, has entered the cognitive niche as, as we have. Uh, he argues a number of things, including our hands, uh, color vision uh, drove the human brain growth, but um, group living is one of those things uh, that also drove human brain growth. So um, to get back to stories, you know, stories help us <clears throat> uh, understand our social environment because stories are rich with social information. And as Scully Sugiyama says, by simulating a variety of social relationships, behaviors, and consequences, narrative also provides us with an opportunity to gain information about our social environment. She goes on to say, a deep and broad understanding of human nature can greatly improve an individual's survival and reproduction prospects. You know, of course, she's talking about uh, you know, our, the evolutionary past. 100,000 years ago in the savannah, so to speak. But you know, one can imagine that it remains true now. Um, every time we watch a rom-com, for example, especially when we're young, we're gleaning something about mate selection um, to use um, you know, the unromantic evolutionary term. We're gleaning something about mate selection that might help us in real life, help us find a partner in real life. So, um, because reading minds is central to life, it's naturally central to fiction. A lot of fictional drama, uh, everything from sitcoms to, to tragedies, depends on characters trying to infer the thoughts, feelings, intentions, and beliefs of other minds that are opaque to them. Uh, Pride and Prejudice, for example, depends on Elizabeth Bennett mis misreading Mr. Darcy, misreading the mind of Mr. Darcy. And as soon as she apprehends the contents of, of his mind, you know, of course, the story rapidly comes to a close. So watching characters read minds 
appears to help us with our own mind reading in real life. Studies show that reading fiction, especially literary fiction, does improve theory of mind. So this is all a way of saying that other uh, minds fascinate us and hold our attention in fiction. And that's why I say this might hearten those who feel confined by problem structure because problems are not just you know, car crashes or, or asteroids headed for Earth. Um, the greatest problems are uh, problems of the social world. So our attention can be held uh, by subtle, intimate, character-driven fiction that's rich in social information. Okay, so I'm coming to the last section of uh, the presentation. Thank you for, for your attention. Um, and I'm gonna look at the literary example. So the literary example I'm going to look at is Enduring Love by Ian McEwan. And I'm just going to read the first uh, two paragraphs of the novel. And then I'll proceed to talk about, you know, some of the strategies at work and some, including some that we haven't talked about yet. But I feel myself getting parched, so it's a good time for, for a sip of water. All right, so let, let's just read uh, the first uh, two paragraphs of Enduring Love. The beginning is simple to mark. We were in sunlight under a turkey oak, partly protected from a strong gusty wind. I was kneeling on the grass with a corkscrew in my hand and Clarissa was passing me the bottle. 1987 Dumas Cassac. This was the moment, this was the pinprick on the time map. I was stretching out my hand and as the cool neck and the black foil touched my palm, we heard a man's shout. We turned to look across the field and saw the danger. Next thing, I was running toward it. The transformation was absolute. I don't recall dropping the corkscrew or getting to my feet or making a decision or hearing the caution Clarissa called after me. What idiocy to be racing into this story and its labyrinths, sprinting away from our happiness among the fresh spring grasses by the oak. There was the shout again and a child's cry, enfeebled by the wind that roared in the tall trees along the hedgerows. I ran faster. And there suddenly from different points around the field, four other men were converging on the scene, running like me. All right, so, um, you know, I hope it's not just me. I hope everyone finds uh, the beginning of Enduring Love uh, gripping um, and, and agrees that it invites and holds attention. So I'd like to spend, you know, the last part of this presentation considering why. Um, obviously, uh, there are agents and actions in, in the opening of this novel. And clearly, there's a problem, clearly, um, there's some kind of, something is, you know, very clearly wrong in the, in the opening. But I think it's important to, to note also that this is a moment of significant change. Uh, not just change, but as the narrator says, total transformation. The transformation was absolute. So um, in his book, The Science of Storytelling, okay, which is kind of, um, I, I guess it's a craft book. Um, based on evolutionary and, and neuroscientific principles, Will Storr talks about change being endlessly fascinating to brains. And then he cites Professor Sophie Scott, who says, almost all perception is based on the detection of change. Our perceptual systems basically don't work unless there are changes to detect. So this is a moment of uh, tremendous change. And, and of course, uh, this moment of tremendous change also brings uh, heightened emotion. And, and one of the reasons emotions have uh, been naturally selected for is, is they give us a rapidity of response to the environment that is much greater than, you know, just rationalizing things. And we can, we saw in that passage, you know, with, uh, you know, from, from Enduring Love that the narrator doesn't think, you know, his, his emotions have clearly have compelled him to drop his picnic with his wife and to respond to the immediate situation. So this sudden change also comes with it, this heightened sense of emotion. And Will Storr goes on to say, when unexpected change strikes, we wanna know what does it mean? Is this change for the good 
for the bad. Unexpe unexpected change makes us curious, and curious is how we should feel in the opening movements of an effective story. So obviously, you know, change is important at the beginning of a story. The beginning of a story is usually when there's some uh, disruption of the status quo and something out of the ordinary happens and that inaugurates the story sooner or later, right? You need to disrupt the status quo and to answer the question, why now? Um, but because change is so endlessly fascinating, it has to continue throughout um, the story. We can imagine this very vivid opening attenuating if nothing else changes uh, hereafter. So that's one aspect that makes this, the, the opening very compelling is the, is the change, the sudden change. Um, but something else that makes it uh, compelling is the, um, you know, the vividness of the opening and the, the sensory details. Probably all of you can remember the strong gusty wind and the cool neck and the black foil of the wine bottle, almost as if you were touching it yourself, the fresh spring grasses by the oak, and so on. So in this article uh, by Annie Murphy Paul, Your Brain on Fiction, uh, she talks about how um, a language in a story doesn't just stimulate the language processing parts of your brain but sensory details can stimulate the sensory cortex and uh, the corresponding parts uh, of the sensory cortex related to whatever sense is being described in the fiction. In this case, smell lavender, cinnamon and soap, um, you know, triggers a part of the brain devoted uh, to smells, which I guess would be the, the hippocampus. Um, and it's not just you know, concrete sensory details, not just the five senses, but descriptions of motion will affect the motor cortex. And the brain can even distinguish between descriptions of arm movements and leg movements and the corresponding part of the brain will be activated. This is also true of metaphor. Um, and it's interesting to note that you know, uh, when you're working metaphorically, and the, the metaphor is concrete and, and sensory will you know, arouse the corresponding parts of the brain in ways that abstractions will not. So the singer had a velvet voice or he had leathery hands will rouse the sensory cortex, whereas the singer had a pleasing voice and he had strong hands, uh, those phrases will not. So this is actually giving us something of a neuroscientific basis to the old saw show and uh, don't tell, right? Show, don't tell. Um, so Murphy Paul concludes the brain doesn't make much of a distinction between reading about an experience and encountering it in real life. In each case, the same neurological regions are stimulated. Basically, fiction gives us an embodied simulation. It's not just that we understand intellectually. Rather, we are basically experiencing it as if it were happening to us, especially since we have something called mirror neurons. A mirror neurons, as the term suggests, mirror other people, uh, mirror um, other people's actions and, and feelings. It's not that when we see someone sad, we simply empathize intellectually. We are actually feeling sad ourselves because our mirror neurons are firing. And that explains the rapidity with which we can understand, apprehend other people's mental states, because we are literally feeling the same thing. So, um, you know, the concrete sensory details are trying to produce that embodied simulation in the reader. Finally, one more thing. Um, we all noticed, of course, that part of the reason that the passage is engaging is we, we know something is wrong, but we don't know exactly what. We know that there's a danger, but we don't yet know exactly what the danger is. And this is part of, of course, what's compelling our attention. As Will Storr says, humans have an extraordinary thirst for knowing how things work and why. Storytellers excite these instincts by creating worlds, but stopping short of telling readers everything about them. So, you know, the, the, the mind has an insatiable desire to know. There have been experiments, for example, 
where participants are asked to turn over tiles on a computer screen. And, um, you know, the, the first group will uh, be asked uh, to turn over, say, five tiles. And each time they turn over a tile, they'll see a picture of a horse. Um, and uh, when they get to five tiles, they'll usually stop because they know what's going to be underneath the towel because they see every time that it's a horse. Another group that's asked to turn over tiles, they might just see the emerging image of some kind of animal that they can't yet discern. And that group, when they get to five, most people will continue to flip tiles because they want to know what the animal is. They want to figure it out. Okay. So that's just an example of our brain's, you know, uh, curiosity when we don't know, uh, we don't ha have all the information. And as uh, Will Store says, there's a natural inclination to resolve information gaps. Okay. Or he's actually citing George Lowenstein, even for questions of no importance. The more context we learn about a mystery, the more anxious we become to solve it. So Ian McEwen is very much playing with information gaps. And not surprisingly, Ian McEwen himself has says narrative tension is primarily about withholding information. Now, I myself, you know, often hesitate to uh, give this advice to my students because they often misunderstand and they, you know, they're already withholding too much. Um, and I often tell them what they need to do is to tell us what we need to know in order for the drama to matter. And I try to explain that, you know, these two pieces of advice that are seemingly contradictory are in fact, you know, two sides of the same coin, um, that you have to find the right rate of revelation in a story, but the explanation always feels kind of clunky and unsatisfactory, um, but brain science can actually offer a little bit perhaps of a better explanation. Um, and so Will Storr says, curiosity is shaped like a lowercase n. It's at its weakest when people have no idea about the answer to a question and also when entirely convinced they do. The place of maximum curiosity, the zone in which storytellers play is when people think they have some idea but aren't quite sure. So uh, we're, we're at the last slide here and I'm just trying to represent this uh, on a graph. And so on the y-axis, we have curiosity from low to high and we have on the x-axis information. And here is the uh, lowercase n of curiosity. It looks something like this. And you know what Will Storr is suggesting is we have too little information we uh, start to, our attention starts to flag. But if we have too much information, our attention also starts to flag. And um, when Ian McEwen says, tell us, you know, narrative tension is about withholding information. What he's saying is don't give us too much information. You have to hold back some of it. And when Richard Bausch says, tell us what we need to know in order for the drama to matter, he's saying, don't give us too little information. Um, otherwise, we will lose interest. And so together, what they're really saying is stay in that zone of maximum curiosity, where we know what we need to know, but we don't yet know everything. And that's where, you know, our attention um, is going to be um, at its at its peak. So I think there's more we could obviously say about the Ian McEwen piece and even more we can say about, you know, evolutionary approaches to fiction, but I'm going to end my conversation or my, my, my uh, presentation there so that I can answer some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pull up the Q&A. And I know that there were some questions that were pre-submitted. I'm going to try to answer some of them and um, take a look at some of the new questions. Um, can a writer, I'm just going to start with, I'm going to start with what looks like a new question that was just asked. Can a writer ever really inhabit the mind of a fictional character? 
how can I, as a writer, get out of my own head? Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, there's, a, there's a writer named Frederick Riken who talks about the, it's getting a little bit technical, the author, narrator, character merge. And uh, it's basically, his thesis is basically that, you know, a lot of first novels, semi-autobiographical novels um, are less interesting than they could be because the author has merged themselves with the narrator and the character. It's a thinly veiled version of themselves and they haven't created much separation. Some people are very good at writing about themselves, frankly. There is, of course, a whole school now of auto fiction. And some people might be good at making uh, themselves or a character like themselves interesting. And others, perhaps less so. I perhaps suffered from the author, character, narrator merge um, early on in my career. Um, so how do you inhabit a fictional character? There's something that Will Storr talks about in the science of storytelling is that you know, every character has a sacred flaw, he says. Every character has a sacred flaw. What he means is that everyone inhabits, um, you know, their own model of reality. Each of us lives inside our own model of reality. Reality seems like something that's out there, but it's something that's actually reconstructed in the silent vaults of our brains. And he argues that when, our brain, when we're young, the world shapes our brains. And then once our brains stop growing, our brains shape the world and we will vigorously defend our model of reality, our model of the world, despite facts, you know, despite uh, counter evidence. This of course explains a lot of, you know, our experience in the world today, politics and so on, is that um, we're all very vigorous. Everyone is very vigorous uh, model defender. And he argues that we all have a sacred flaw. Some, somewhere in our past, our, you know, some crucial experience defined our model of reality. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to inhabit a character, ask yourself what the character's sacred flaw is. Uh, most of us have a very hard time seeing our own sacred flaw. Um, but maybe you can try to invent one for a character so that the character seems outside of yourself. So, you know, the, one of the terms he uses is origin damage. We all have some originary moment where this damage was baked into us, into our model of reality. What was that origin damage and how does it um, shape all of their actions thereafter? The example he goes back to frequently in the book is the remains of the day. And, you know, for those of you who know the book or the, by Kazuo Ishiguro or the, the movie that was based on the novel, you know, it's about an English butler. And, you know, he learned from his father that the virtue uh, in life is emotional restraint. That is the pinnacle of not only being a butler, but of, you know, being uh, a person, British person is emotional restraint. And so this is the flaw that's baked into his model of reality and, and everything thereafter, his inability to grieve his father's death, his inability to respond to Miss Kensington's uh, you know, expressions of love all come from this sacred flaw. So um, that's one way perhaps to, to think about inventing character. All right, I'm gonna get to some of these other questions. Um, how do I keep the reader engaged as a character uh, transforms or undergoes emotional change throughout the story. How do I keep the reader engaged as a character transforms or undergoes emotional change throughout the story? So, you know, we talked about how change um, is endlessly fascinating to brains. And um, so, of course, throughout the story, as the character changes, um, there's, there's going to be all sorts of acute tensions in the story, right? Immediate problems and tensions um, that create that feeling of change, that feeling of motion. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, if you're thinking, if this question is talking about the trajectory, you know, of the course of a story, a novel, I, I think it's helpful to think about changes in fortune. You know, what, what is the change in the character's fortune throughout the course of the story? 
because the character can change, but if they're slowly headed in one direction, you know, from, you know, ill to good fortune or vice versa, and, and, and it's a steady path the whole way through, that character might be changing, but there might not be as much drama because the trajectory is very obvious to us. You know, Kurt Vonnegut has a video that everyone can look up online about the shapes of stories, but essentially what he's graphing in these various you know, uh, shapes that he draws is uh, changes in the character's fortune. Um, you know, the character's fortune or their uh, ability to, you know, um, overcome an obstacle or satisfy their desires. You know, it has to vacillate throughout the story. And the way I often describe it is it's kind of like a lead change in, in sports. You know, if the lead changes a lot, we're, we're watching to the end, but if it's a blowout from the beginning, or we know, you know, one team is steadily increasing their lead throughout, our, our attention is going to wane. So think about creating those kinds of lead changes, as it were, in your character's fortune throughout uh, a narrative. Um, okay, so uh, can you please expand on the concept of pacing and intention? In storytelling, how do we know when to slow down and when to speed up the action? Can you please expand on the concept of pacing and attention in storytelling? How do we know when to slow down and when to speed up? Um, so, uh, you know, that makes me think of Jane Smiley in her book, um, uh, 13 Ways of Looking at a Novel. She talks about the characteristic movements of novels. And she says that novels alternate between action and reflection. So, you know, things happen, of course, to characters in a novel. But in novels, as in life, characters need time to make sense of what's happened to them. So it's not necessarily to the advantage of a novel to have um, action upon action upon action upon action um, to compel our attention. Sometimes um, we need to sort of move back and forth between action and reflection in order for the characters to make sense of what's going on. And so of course, action are those moments when usually crucial decisions are being made and the characters exercising some agency and we're rendering those moments in scene and therefore slowing time down. And then that usually alternates of course not only with reflection, but occasionally moments of summary when we need to encapsulate time um, and you know, to move more briskly through those moments when the character is perhaps not engaged in some decisive moment or exercising agency. So, um, you know, I, I just wanna to pause to say too, um, and appreciate you know, all of you are still here listening, that you know, I, I I appreciate that there's lots of experimental fiction and um, you know anti stories and and all, you know, all sorts of narrative out there, and and I'm certainly not suggesting you know one kind of fiction over another. So I often say to my students, any narrative that's counterfactual is fiction, but not all fiction aspires to be a story. And a, and a lot of the things that I'm talking about tonight are for those who are interested in telling a story. Uh, more than just say, uh, you know, let's say philosophical uh, fiction or novel of ideas or what have you, that you're, you're interested in telling uh, a story. And, um, you know, culture, of course, is a very significant overlay over, over our evolutionary past. And culture can teach us to appreciate all kinds of things. Um, there are all kinds of reasons people might read, for example, Finnegan's Wake, um, but most people don't, you know, get effortlessly lost in a story when they read Finnegan's Wake, if they read Finnegan's Wake. Um, you know, and so what I'm talking about is the effortlessness because storytelling is a human universal. You know, some of us are, are trained by practice or, or education to read certain kinds of texts, but you don't need specialized training to appreciate a story. It's part of human life. You know, and if I were to tell you a story like Once Upon a Time, there was a girl and she got lost in the woods. And as she cried desperately for her mother, she saw uh, you know, a brown bear in her path. 
you know, if I start to tell you that story, you're, you're pretty effortlessly, I think, uh, drawn into that story. It doesn't take, doesn't take work. It doesn't take a special training to enter that story. And, you know, you know, some of the advice that I'm talking about is trying to tap into what Jonathan Gottschall calls the witchery of story, you know, that effortlessness, that native ability we all have just to, to be drawn into a story. Um, so, yeah, I think we have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to try to get to a couple more uh, questions. Um, so one question here is, what's the best strategy when it comes to using backstory? Where in the piece, when, what are effective? This, this question is perhaps related. Um, what are effective novel uh, methods for keeping the reader engaged when going back in time to give some historical narrative? So as you know, as a general principle, um, stories should stay, start at the latest possible moment. That's sort of the general principle. So um, stories therefore don't usually start with backstory. It's something that you can fold in later. Um, but of course, that's not always the case. I can think of lots of examples, including a story like Terrific Mother by Laurie Moore, which begins with a tragedy. A woman drops uh, someone else's baby and the baby um, bleeds fatally into the brain. And that's how the story starts, but it's really the backstory. It's a very changeful thing that begins the story, but it's really the backstory and the story in the here and now is really about her trip with her partner to Italy to try to overcome this grief. Um, but, you know, try to, um, <clears throat> you know, start your story at the latest possible moment and tell us what we need to know in order for the drama to matter. And often backstory, the origin damage uh, or the chronic tension of the story often comes in, often comes in later. And of course, you know, when we talk about backstory, when we talk about a flashback, that doesn't have to be in summary, that can be in scene, it can be very immersive and can be full of change and problems and, and um, use all the techniques for holding attention that we've been talking about. Backstory certainly doesn't have to be a mere summary of the past. All right, that's probably more than, you know, um, I'm trying your patience at this point. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate um, most of you hanging on to the bitter end. And um, I don't know if Bruce is coming back on. Yes. Or not, but um, I'm very grateful to everyone for, for being here. And um, yeah, and I hope that uh, you learned something about our propensity for stories. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great. That's great, Jack. Um, thanks very much. Terrific journey uh, through our human evolution and the role of storytelling and how that's played out um, in our past and is playing out today. We've had over 100 attendees, and I imagine everyone is thinking about evolving their own stories and perhaps myself and my fellow fiction editors at uh, the New Quarterly will be reading some of them one day. Uh, if so, please don't forget about the power of metaphors as Jack highlighted, that was terrific. In closing, I wanna remind our viewers that Jack's books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books in Waterloo. The link on, uh, to this online ordering in the Q &A is in the Q&A section of your screening. It can be found at wildwriters.ca. Also a reminder that uh, this session, like most of our events at the festival has been recorded and it's uh, provided free of charge. And if you feel compelled to donate in support of the festival, you'll find a link to do so on the festival website. And just to reiterate that, that this session has been recorded and will be available through the festival if you want to view it again. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, conversation as, as much as I did. And don't forget the next Wild Writers Literary Festival event is inspired by true stories with Helen Humphreys and Nicole Smith tomorrow night, uh, Thursday, November 5th from 7 to 8 p.m. And I will hope you will join us then. And um, uh, just a reminder as well 
that the uh, website uh, for uh, the books and donation, wildwriters.ca slash books and wildwriters.ca slash donate. Um, thank you all for attending tonight's session.